terrific. Hi, Beryl. Hi, it's Tanya. Good to see everybody, quote unquote, see. Glad I didn't chase away everybody from last week's sheer. I know it was uh, very frenetic, fast move, fast, fast paced sheer. Um, but again, before we get started, this is just intended to be a quick overview of the Torah upon which the Lakute Halachos, that we're going to be learning, the, the Halachos in Lakute Halachos that we're going to be learning, is based upon. So even if uh, someone is, does not become intimately familiar with all aspects of the Torah, at least will be familiar on the same page with regard to the topics, and uh, we'll have that, that basis to learn the Halachos. It was a short enough Torah that I didn't want to I didn't feel I needed to, to skip it, um, but rather to give everybody the benefit of hearing Rabbeinu Zal's words directly. Okay, so let's get started. Thank you, Hashem, for giving me the opportunity to learn again uh, and share Rabbeinu Zal's and Rabbeinu Zal's holy words with other people who want to learn and grow. And uh, thank you for joining me. Um, just as a quick review from last week, um, I want to just mention a couple of the key topics. And of course, anybody with any comments can, can type it in. Um, I was thinking of doing a quick review in a minute or two, and then learning the rest of the Torah Torah tests, nine. And then uh, maybe if anybody has any questions, comments, or ideas that they wanted to share, you know, giving a, a couple of minutes if there's any of that. Um, so, Baruch Hashem, my voice is, is better this week than it was last week. And uh, hopefully that won't be a distraction this week. So, we started out last week by saying that. A person, when he davens, needs to put all of his kohos, all of his energy, all of his power into his davening. And we said that tefillah also kind of like is the most important thing in the world, and yet it oftentimes gets relegated to the bottom of the pile. There's a reason for that. We also said that um, prayer, tefillah, has 12... Uh, is connected to the 12 Shvatim, the 12 tribes, the 12 sons of Yaakov. And, um, and each Shevet has a special gate, a special Shah, through which his tefillah or their tefillah goes up to Shemayim. And uh, it's important that a person try to uh, identify to the best of his ability um, Welcome back, Pamela. I'm glad we didn't scare you away last week. I started out by saying we were a little frenetic last week. Uh, again, it was only designed as an overview, and we're going to take it a little bit slower tonight. And you guys are just going to absolutely love when we start learning the Lakute Halachos, because you'll be, if not very familiar, at least you'll be peripherally familiar with the topics and be so, so wonderful and valuable and practical. It's every time I sit down and learn uh, halacha from Rav Nassim's Lekute Halachos, I, I'm, I'm struck with humility and awe that, that I have access to such, such wisdom and such practical advice. It's, it's, I'm not, there's no hyperbole in what I'm saying. Uh, the last, one of the last times I was learning, I actually stopped and said, I stopped and I kept repeating, thank you, Hashem, thank you, Hashem, thank you, Hashem, for exposing me to this. So uh, so hang in there and, uh, and don't be discouraged. And we'll, 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 we'll try to keep everybody uh, on board. Um, so we said that there are 12 gates through, the, through which each of the 12 shvakim, each of the 12 tribes, prayers go up to Shemayim. And we said, that it's important for a person to try to direct his prayers to the gates. And we don't know which shave it we're really from. So that's a little bit of a problem. So maybe a person has in mind, or they could even say at the beginning, you know, Hashem, help guide my tefillos through the, through the appropriate gate. Um, but also we're going to find out later on that the tzaddik hador, the tzaddik hador, 
plays a very important role in this process because the tzaddik ador, as we're going to see, has the ability to take the different uh, tfilos of the generation and direct them to the gate that's appropriate. So all is not lost just because we don't know uh, what shave it we're from exactly. Uh, the main thing is our our heartfelt and sincere intent and effort. And God willing, uh, Hashem will cause the, the right circumstances to come along that will make our prayers as effect, efficacious as possible. So we also said that um, that there's a realm of kohavim, mazalo, stars, etc. Again, they don't have, possess any power on their own. This is just a model. So we can understand how Hashem set, set up the world. Um, but they, they have the ability, as given to Hashem, but to them by Hashem, to influence the physical world. The Gemara says that a, a blade of grass doesn't grow here, down here on earth without a malach uh, hitting it, meaning calling it, saying, okay, your chance, your turn to go. Let's go. Let's get started. Um, so, but how do, how do the Kohavim uh, get their power, their energy? How, where do they get that from? Well, they get them actually from our, from our tefillos, from our prayers. They become energized, and then they have the ability to do what they're supposed to do to positively influence the world. I think that's a really cool idea to keep in mind when we're davening, because we're not davening to make Hashem happy. We're not davening because, um, they, they, because it's an obligation. We're davening because the sustenance of the world actually depends on our prayers. We are very, very factually and demonstratively affecting the world we live in. That's a beautiful and powerful thought to keep in mind. Um, when we're davening, because, you know, to the best of our ability, we really uh, have the ability to, to effectuate lots of beautiful things. Um, and then we said that also the concept of 12, so we have the 12 shvatim, the 12 gates of prayer. We also have the 12 shvilim, the 12 pathways through the yamsuf, through the sea that the Bnei Yisrael traveled in and their exodus from the Tzrayim, which is important also, which we will discuss. Um, I know that I'm saying this is important, but you, it's not that you have to make a list and remember them. It's just simply that it's in your RAM somewhere. And then when we start discussing these topics, I'll, I'll say, remember, we learned in the Torah. And you'll say, yes, actually, I do remember we mentioned that. So that, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning it, that that'll be important. Um, we also said that Hashem has given us a special role by allowing us to have a perception that we're contributing to him in a certain uh, certain way. And as a result of that, it gives, quote unquote, him the opportunity to treat us mida kenegin mida, quid pro quo, that um, he will then provide us with our parnasa, which is also a beautiful thing. You know, when we dive in, we're not just begging Hashem, we beg Hashem, absolutely. But we're also... Hashem has given us, in a certain sense, the ability to contribute to Him, so to speak. When I, again, I, I'm, I'm not saying that we are actually making a contribution. Hashem doesn't need us, and He's the same before and after. He's immutable. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that He desires our prayers, and as a result of that, He responds to our prayers. <coughs> Still a little bit of a cough. Then we said that. In Yaakov Avinu, uh, Tzafani is saying Hashem and Emet have an affinity, thereby opening doorways of prayer. Yes, uh, we're, I was going to get to that in a couple of more stages down in my notes. Absolutely. We're going to get to that in one second. So we also said that all the Shvatim are embodied in Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu was the, the master of prayer. He, he epitomized tefillah. And uh, as a result of that, he was able to hand over to his 12 sons also the ability to pray. And each one, each one of the Shvatim took it and ran with it on their own and developed their own style, their own gait, so to speak. And, and, but Yaakov Avinu is, is the embodiment of the entire system. So we're going to see how that plays out too. Um, he also said that when a person tries to daven, they're amazingly immediately beset 
with a myriad of external and disturbing thoughts sometimes. Thoughts, sometimes you dive in as you're diving and you say, uh, how did I get here? I don't even know what happened to the last five minutes. Or sometimes you say, I cannot believe I'm having this thought during davening. And it's, if you would actually share that thought with, uh, with another human being, you would be quite embarrassed. Um, but, but these external thoughts create an environment that is distressing to us because we say this is our opportunity to beseech Hashem, to thank Him, to express ourselves, and we're being distracted by Marishkeit, or or sometimes even worse. So it, it's distressing, and it's and we and we think we're not being effective. So um, it seems like it's a darkness, and it also seems like we can't find the way out of our situation because we know the way out of our situation is through tefillah. And when we can't daven or we don't feel we're davening properly, then it seems like all the doors are closed. And that's a very, very uh, challenging situation to be in. But Rabbi Nachman points out that just like when a person wants to, God forbid, do the wrong thing, Shemayim opens a door for him and says, fine, you want to go ahead and do something you're not supposed to do? Fine, we'll let you. It's fine. It's not that it's fine, but we'll let you go ahead and, and make that decision. You have the fear. You have the free choice. So Rabbi Nachman says, if those doors are there for that purpose, then you better believe that those doors are there for the other purpose, for the good purpose, and to save you and to give you guidance that you need in your life and to give you the ethos, the, the, the advice and then solutions and et cetera, et cetera, that you need in your life. So he says, you bet you, if those doors are there to let someone go the wrong direction, those same doors are there to help us uh, get back into the right direction. But we need to see the doors, and, and, and it's dark. So what do we do? I know this is a lot of imagery. It's beautiful imagery. Um, but what do we do? It's dark. I can't see the doors. I don't even know the doors are there. What do I do? Well, I need a light. And we said that Hashem is the source of that light. And here, Tzifanya, is what you said, that how do we access, how do we activate the light of Hashem? We activate it by tapping into MS, truth. And uh, Nachman advised that keep your davening simple. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, don't try to have ex um, uh, complex uh, thought processes, thinking about things that are way beyond our human capability, Kabbalistically or whatever. That's not what Hashem wants. What Hashem wants is simplicity and sincerity and most of all, truth. MS. So when we employ the mechanism of truth in our davening, even if our davening is not as, as, as crystal clear as we would like it to be, which invariably it probably isn't, um, even due to the fact that the better someone gets, probably the better he wants to be above that. Um, but when a person uh, approaches their tefillah with, with truth, that really excites Hashem. Hashem wants to be close to the person who's speaking truth. And when Hashem gets close to the person who's speaking truth, he shines his light. And all of a sudden, people can see the solutions to their situations. We also correlated this to the um, story of the Teva. I refer to story, quote unquote, in the Chumash, where Noah is instructed to build the Teva and Mark and put a, put a Sohar in the Ark. Um, and, and <coughs> excuse me. And um, the word Sohar is an interesting word because Rashi says it could mean one of two things. It could either mean a Chalon, a window, or it can mean an Evan Tov, a good stone. So what's the difference between a, uh, a window and a good stone? Well, Rashi explains that a uh, Chalon is a pass-through. So there's a light on one side of the window, and it allows that light to pass through to the other side of the window. But it itself does not generate any independent light. It's not a source of light. It's only a pass-through. Still a pretty good idea. Still very effective at bringing light into the room. Absolutely. Nothing to sneeze at. Thank God. We had enough sneezing. But, um, but, but, not, but, not, but not as good as an Evan Tope. Because an Evan Tova has, it, it generates its own light. It's, it, it's its own power plant. Um, we're going to see that, you know, I'm going to save it as a surprise because we'll, we'll get to the, 
in the uh, in the halal. So th that basically is what we got up to so far. And now we're going to continue in the Torah, and we're going to we're going to um, there's also a a nice a story, the Nabba Babachana, from the Gemara, which is a little bit complicated to explain at first, but you'll see by the time we're all done that you do understand it, hopefully. And it's not all that complicated. So try to bear with me, try to stick with me, and um, and we'll do our best. And again, at the end, God willing, um, if anybody has any questions about it or about any part of it, we can certainly spend a couple of minutes discussing that. So Rebbe Nachman starts out here, and he says, Every person needs to bind his prayers to the tzaddik of the generation. Now, we're not praying to the tzaddik of the generation, but what we're saying is, you know what? Spiritually speaking, the tzaddik of the generation knows more than I do. He's holier than I am. And that's why he's the tzaddik of the generation. I can't say personally, Elio Hach, sitting in Elizabeth, New Jersey, I can't, I personally cannot identify um, the Tzadike Hador. I can say that certainly the Gedole Hador of our generation are good candidates, um, but exactly who is the Tzadik Hador, that could be up to a person's own determination or discussion with their own Rav, etc. cetera. Um, but more importantly, just in an abstract sense, even if we just say, without identifying a particular person who is the Tzadik Hador, it, it could be enough to just say, that the tzaddik hador is out there, and I want my tefillos to be connected to him or her, I guess, as the case may be. And the tzaddik knows how to direct to those gates. And he knows how to make sure that every prayer hits its mark, gets to the gate that's appropriate for it. He called tzaddik v'tzaddik u'bechinas Moshe Mashiach. Now here, I mean, that's a beautiful, beautiful connection. Each tzaddik of any, every generation is comparable to Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu, and Mashiach. Now, you'll see it's a hyphenated because Moshe Mashiach is going to explain. Can Moshe Amar, as they say, Moshe Shapa Ka'amar. In the Gemara, sometimes when uh, two uh, Amarayim are discussing the topic, and one has expressed himself with crystal clear uh, cogency, then the other one responds with, you're like, like Moshe Rabbeinu. Beautiful. And he says, Moshe, well have you spoken. So we see that the application or the appellation of the term or idea of Moshe is applicable to tzaddikim. So, I hope that's clear. So in other words, in this generation, we can call Moshe Moshe as if in the context of Moshe Rabbeinu, that he is the Tzaddik Hador. Ad ki yavo shilo, until Mashiach comes, Shilo is a reference to Mashiach, Moshe, that's Moshe. Moshe, it's interesting because Rabbi Nachman always uses Chumash, not as a, a one-time lesson, but rather as a paradigm going forward. So every Golis is connected to Mitzrayim, conceptually speaking, and every Mashiach that we have, the, uh, the Moshe Rebbe is connected to Moshe Rebbe. So when Mashiach himself comes, he will be an extension of, or a reflection of Moshe Rebbe. So Mashiach, and Mashiach incorporates all prayers. And because of this, because Mashiach is all about prayer, in other words, that's, the Mashiach's main weapon, as we're going to see, is going to be prayer. And that's how he's going to conquer the world and, and wow everybody and, and get everything under control and reveal Hashem's. Remember, we were talking about the idea of the Meshadech, Kutshibrihu, Shchinte, the upper level, quote unquote, of Hashem and the lower level of Hashem. And I explained to the best of my ability that the Shechina is Hashem's presence as it exists from our perception in this world. And that from our perception, Hashem is pretty hidden. But when we increase Hashem awareness in this world, we are elevating Hashem's presence by making his presence known and, and, and realized and felt and understood. 
And as a result of that, it's as if we're creating a union from below to above. So the Mashiach is going to come and he's going to be able to do things by smell. With his nose, with the smell, actual smell. Marach Vadaim, he's going to be able to smell and judge. Someone says, well, who's right, who's wrong? He's going to smell. He's going to know by the, the power of smell um, who's right and who's wrong. Kamosh Amr, as it says in the Gemara, Prayer is a concept of the nose. Why? Because it says in the Pasuk, And because of my praise, I will withhold, quote unquote, uh, parentheses, withhold my wrath. Echtam means, it means nose, but it means like when somebody's angry, their nose flares, you know, they express their anger, their nose, nose is flaring. So Hashem is saying, because of my praise, I will withhold my wrath. So you see that there's a connection between prayer and the nose. The Zepeirish, and this is what the, what the meaning is, the explanation, Now, here we're going into the story of Rabba Babachana. Zim, now, there's several stories in the Gemara by Rabba Babachana, and they're very, very obscure, very, very opaque. They're hard to understand. And, um, but you'll see the explanation that Rabbi Nachman gives of this story is absolutely wonderful. Amar Abba Barachana, Abba Barachana said, Zimna One time we were going in the Midbar, in the desert, and we were being accompanied by this particular Arab um, um, merchant. <coughs> Excuse me. The Havishakel Afra Umarachle, who would take dirt, dirt from the ground and smell it. Ba'amar and say, and then he would say, Ha or Khaladukta plan, this is the direction to such and such a place. The Ha or Khaladukta plan, and this is the direction to such and such a place. So which way is so and such and such a town? He'd smell the dirt and he would know which way to go. They didn't have uh, Google Maps in those days or uh, ways. So uh, this was the next best thing. Amrina Lay, so they said to him, we said to him, Kama Merchakinan Mimaya, how far are we from water? Important thing to know, we're in the desert. How far are we from water? Vahamalan, and he said to us, Havuli Afra, bring me dirt. That's my, uh, that's my method. Avina Lay, we gave it to him. Amalan, so he said to us, Tamanya Parse, that's about eight miles. A parse is not a mile, but we'll just say mile. So a, a linear measurement. It's eight, eight parsa. I'd say eight miles. Tanainan, the Avina Lake, so we did it again. He gave him, we went ahead and, and, and gave him again some dirt. Amalan, and he said to us, Amachikan, tell us a parse. Ah, oh, getting better. Now we're three miles away, three parses away. And then we tried to trick him. We tried to switch it up, but we couldn't best him. We couldn't get the better of him. He was not, he was good, and he was not going to get uh, uh, distracted or, 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 or sent down the wrong path. They kept switching the dirt around. They couldn't believe him. He knew what he was talking about. But he was right every time. Now, this is a, that's the whole story. Very, very, <coughs> very, very confusing story. Clearly, there's a hidden message here of the deepest kind. So listen to how Rabbeinu Zal is going to explain this beautiful lesson in light of what we've been discussing. Zim Nechada, one time, and he's going to quote sections from the story as, as, he, as he explicates them, explains them. So one time we were going, traveling, and we were with this particular Arab merchant. So the Rashbam, Rashbam, who who works as as the Rashi in this Gemara, explains Taya. What is a Taya? Translated as an Arab merchant, because that's the way the Rashbam explains it. Socher, 
a socher is a merchant, Yishmael, a Yishmaeli a, a merchant, an Arab merchant. Then he says, Zad Bechinas Tzadik Hador. And that's actually a hidden reference to the Tzadik Hador. So the Arab merchant in our story is a hidden reference to the Tzadik Hador. Shehu Kolo Kol who embodies all prayer just like Mashiach. And these prayers are in the context of the Socha Yishmael, the Arab merchant. And Moshe Kosov, as it says, now, so in other words, we're not going to explain how do we know that an Arab merchant, a Socha Yishmael, is correlated to Tfilah, to Tzadik Hador. How do we know that? So now he's going to bring a Pasa, because it says in the Pasa, in Bereshis, Ki Shama Hashem El Anyech. Hashem has heard. Your um, your distress, your affliction, meaning Hagar was out there and she cried out to Hashem and He responds to her. He responds to her. I mean, she had just been kicked out of the house. She ran away, and even she, who was not like the the Sadekas Hador, but she cried out with sincerity and Hashem answered her. And He said, Hashem has heard your affliction. He's heard your anguish, your pain. The Targumo and Unklus translates, Kabel Hashem Tlosei. Hashem has accepted your prayers. Wow. And this is the word Socher, he studied Targumo Schor, because in Aramaic, the word Socher means Savi, roundabout. So, the Taya that we said was the Arab merchant is the Socher Yishmael, and Yishmael stands for prayer. And Socher, uh, uh, besides for being a Socher Yishmael, the Yishmael part refers to the prayer, the Socher part refers to roundabout. And this is the notion, the idea of Amuna, the the emunah and your faith is all around. Again, hang with me through the explanation of the story. It all comes together. So so far we have the Arab merchant. The Yishmael part means the tefillah. The uh, socher is translated as merchant, but it also translates as all around. Now the Islavim Bahadin Hu Taya. So again, he quotes the sentence from the story. And he says, and we were accompanied by this particular Arab merchant. So what does it mean in the story when it says we were accompanied by this Arab merchant? It means exactly what we started tonight by saying, that one needs to bind himself to the Tzadik Hador. If the Yishmael is a reference to Tefillah, and Tefillah means Mashiach and Tzadik Hador, then when it says that we were accompanied by the Tzadik Hadori, we were accompanied by this Socha Yishmael, right? So then it means, what it really means is we bound ourselves to the Tzadik Hadori. Forget about the story references that the Arab merchant, but in our explanation, forget about Arab merchant. We're talking about the Tzadik Hadori and his power comes from Tefillah. And so does, just like Mashiach's power comes from Tefillah. And he's surrounded by a Muna wherever he goes. And we bind ourselves to this Sadiq Hador. Shuhub Mashiach, which is uh, just like Mashiach. Khalaliu Satfila, who incorporates, who embodies all of Tefila, all of prayer. The Shakalaf Omarach, so continuing on with the story, he, he, took, uh, he took land. Dirt, rather, he took dirt and he smelled it. But Omar, and he said, This is the way to go to somewhere, and this is the way to go to somewhere else, and that's how to go. So, Afra, where the Nachman says, Dirt, that's also a reference to Tefillah. So, we had Yishmael's reference to Tefillah, and that was the Tzadik Hador. But here we have the word Afra, and he says, That's a reference to Tefillah also. How so? Because it says, 
he will make like he will make his sword like the dirt. Now the cherev is a bichinas and we know cherev um, is a concept of tefila. Like we said um, previously, asher lekachim miyad ha'amori that that which I took from the hand of the amori. The Kharbi Ubakashi with my sword and my bow. So when it says here, Ka'afar Kharba, um, I will make like dirt. His sword, sword is associated with dirt. And sword, we know, is instead of the Kharbi Ubakashi, it means Tfilasi, my prayer. Instead of sword and bow, it means Tfilasi. My prayer and my request. So we see a correlation in this Pasuk. Will place like dirt his sword, meaning there's a correlation between dirt, afar, and, and the and the cherev, which is the sword, which is the prayer, the tefillah. The cherev is the tefillah, and the cherev, the sword, is the concept of tefillah. As I, as I explained my, with my sword and my bow. Omorach, and he smells it. Because this person has the power to smell. And we'll see things in, in that. Because he incorporates all of Tfilos. As it says, in my prayer, I will withhold my, my wrath for you. So in other words, another association between the nose, the echtam, the chotem, which means nose, and tihilasi, which means prayer. But Omar, and he said, plan. So again, with our story, the Arab merchant said this way to a particular, this direction to a particular place. Tfilos. He knew which way the prayers are supposed to go. So now flipping back to the Tzadik Ador, the Tzadik Ador is all about Tfil and Amuna and everything all around him. And, and also Afra, he can smell the, the dirt. He can smell the prayers. The Tzadik Ador has the ability to hear the prayers coming in from all directions of Pa Yisrael and know this one is for this direction. This one goes to that direction. That's beautiful. He knows which prayers are supposed to go to which gates. And he knows each prayer that's relevant to its shevet. And we said to him, How far is it to the water? That was another question we asked this guy. And he said, Bring me dirt. We brought it to him. He said to us, It's eight parsa, eight miles. Now, none of the Avin and Lay, we did it again and we gave him more dirt. Oh, Milan, he said to us, Tosa Parse. Now it's three miles. So, what does this part of the story mean? We tried to switch it up on him, but we weren't able to trick him. I know that is. Amina Lay, we said to him, How far are we from water? Pour forth like water my heart, nochach pene Hashem, before Hashem. So, in other words, the epitome of davening is to be able to pour forth your emotions, your thoughts, your words like water and, 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 and have them crystal clear like fresh water and pouring out of you. So, really, what the, the question in an abstract sense was they were asking the Tzadik Hadur, how do we get to the level? How far are we from water? How far are we from actually having a prayer that's like shifchi libech kamayim, like pouring our hearts out like, like water? <coughs> Excuse me. How far are we from that ideal? Oh, Milan, he said to us, Tamanya, you're eight miles away. Bechinos, hainu limad Torah. Ah, you need limad Torah. Shuhu chamishu chamishu Torah, that's five. Five. So five of the eight miles that you're away from the source of pouring your heart out like water, five of those miles is Kenegid the Chamishu from Shitoro. 
the five books of the Torah, and three prayers. So in other words, with the unity of the five books of Moshe, the Chemisha Chumshe Torah, plus the three prayers that we daven, then that makes up the eight miles. So really what he was hinting at was you want to, you want to be able to daven with such his love and love and, and meaning and, and everything else in connection. First, you need to, you need to learn some Torah and then you need to daven your shachris, your mincha, and your mara. Then we said, we repeated and we gave to him, meaning not that we repeated and gave him more dirt, Tinyana means to learn. Tanina, we learn. So what he's saying is not that they again gave, it, it could mean that they gave him dirt again to try, but it also means that they, they went ahead and, and spent some time learning Torah. And after the study, we gave him more to smell. And then we said, how far are we from this concept of water? Meaning, how far are we from true heartfelt prayer? Well, he said to, to us, parse. now you're only three parsa away. Meaning, connected the three prayers. And he gave us a simon, a sign for this that we had still not gotten to that level where we were pouring forth our heart like water, that we were davening with such amazing kavana, until the extent that we were pouring forth our hearts before him, before Hashem, like water. And this was his proof. In other words, he's giving us a proof that we're not there yet. So that the proof is, is, we switched it around. That's what the word meant in our story. Kamosha Kosovitz, it says, Af Tashi Surchabo. Af, you'll even um, return the, the you, you'll bring back the edge of the sword, and we will not allow you to go out to battle. In other words, someone who's too green, someone who's not ready for, to, see, to see actual combat, can't, is not tested yet to. To, to properly go out and fight a battle, him you don't put in the front line. He's going to melt. He's not ready for it. So in a similar way, afeches means to turn back. Like af tashiv, sur chabo, you turn away the edge of the sword from the battle. Meaning, an acherav means the, the tool of Mashiach, the prayer of Mashiach. The prayer is not ripe yet. It's not ready. Ki kohat filos heim b'chinos cherav Eitzel Mashiach, because all prayer is like a sword in, by Mashiach. That's his main weapon. And if the prayers were appropriate, like as we described above, for sure they would not they would not turn away or send back the quote unquote edge of the sword. In other words, they would allow them to go ahead and and and, and engage in a in, in this kind of uh, holy battle, so to speak. And it was a sign that we had still not yet attained the level of that we have not yet gotten to the level of pouring your heart out before Hashem. So we see a beautiful story that's much more than a story where we see all the components we were discussing. We see the tzadik hador, as represented by Yishmael, which represents tefillah. He's surrounded by Amuna, right? He uh, uses his nose to know which way to go, um, to understand, to judge, to rule, to, to, to decipher. And um, he, he uses that power to take all the tefillahs of a generation and direct them to the gates to the appropriate gate for that person. So even if, like we said in the beginning, even if you don't know which gate your tefillahs are supposed to go through, by praying and asking Hashem for that kind of guidance and having an intention to be connected to the tzaddik or the tzaddik ador, then your tefillahs will get to where they're supposed to go. And then the tzaddik ador gave them a little uh, guidance with regard to how to improve their tefillah by 
first learning Torah and then davening. And then he said, but you're not there yet because, um, because otherwise we would have been able to bring the Mashiach, so to speak, uh, and engage in, 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 in this kind of tefillah battle, so to speak. All right. Hey. Again, not again, but Rabbi Nachman now is going to give us uh, several more concepts which we're going to tie into this whole overarching topic and also going to be very important for, um, for the Likutei Halachas that God willing will start next week. Prayer is a notion of miracle. Rabbi Nachman talks about the idea of believing in miracles, believing in Nisim. We, we, the, the world that we see around us, the physical realm, and what it, what it offers is not the whole story. And as Jews, and um, Jews who are working on increasing their uh, connection with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, we understand that Hashem can do anything He wants, even in the physical world that's, that's quote-unquote bound by the root laws of nature. Those anything outside what would ordinarily be expected is considered a maze, is considered a miracle, and we believe that miracles can happen. And our, when we daven, we're expressing that belief because prayer is the concept of miracle. Prayer and miracle are synonymous. Shu ein because prayer is is something that's not a nase is not something that occurs naturally. Because there are times where the physical reality requires that a certain outcome happen. You know, like, for example, I drop my pen. Uh, it's going to fall. The law of nature, that's going to happen, right? But sometimes a prayer changes that reality. I can state in my own life and then my family's life, that there have been many times where we've done for something and we're totally bewildered about how something could have possibly turned out the way that it did. And there's no other explanation other than, yeah, that wouldn't have been the way that it should have turned out under normal circumstances. And Hashem gave us this one, Derek Mace. The Ikar Hanisim and the main miracles, Hainu Ikar Hatfila, meaning the main method of prayer, the main concept of prayer, in Oelaba Eretz Yisrael, is only in Eretz Yisrael. Now, that's not to say that you don't daven wherever you are. That's not to say that you can't daven, let's say, in America or elsewhere. But what it does mean is that the best place is Eretz Yisrael, by far, and our prayers go through Eretz Yisrael. Moshe Kosovo says, Shchan, Shchan Eretz Urea Munah, dwell in the land and kind of like raise up, graze, um, harvest, emuna. Eretz Yisrael is the land of emuna. The emuna zet fila, and emuna is synonymous with prayer. In Moshe Kosovitz, it says in the Pasuk, Vayihi yadav emuna. So how do we know that emuna is prayer? Because it says in the Pasuk, when Moshe Rabbeinu was on the mountain watching Yoshua in the battle, and he was up there with, um, with Aaron and Hur, he held his hands high, and he was davening. His hands were emuna, meaning they were steady, they were strong. But the, the explanation of, of that is he was engaged in davening to Hashem. He was praying. Kitar Gumo, as the Bunkler says, <laughs> that's why the land of Eretz Yisrael is higher than all the other lands. Al Shem, Shiegar Hanisim, Sham Him. Because the, the main place for Nisim. Or miracles is in Eretz Yisrael. Exceed, so in other words, Nisim are elevated because they're Emuna, Tfila, and Emuna are this uh, Tfila, Emuna, and Nisim are comparable. They're they're synonymous. And when we say that Moshe Rabbeinu's hands were elevated in prayer, we're saying that there, there, there were miracles happening. Miracles are associated with elevation. If Eretz Yisrael is the land of, of miracles, then by definition, it's higher than all the other lands. Uksiv arimi nes, raise up a banner. But the word nes can mean banner, and it could also mean miracle. 
So you see that miracles are elevated. With the Shilzer, Nikres Eretz Canaan, and this is why it's called, the land was called Eretz Canaan. Why was it called Eretz Canaan? Canaan, Russian Socher. Canaan was, is a language of Socher. Socher was, we said, was that merchant, the Arab merchant. But it also meant, we said, Saviv, roundabout. When we said that it meant roundabout, so Canaan is a language, is a, defined also as a Socher. Bechinas Emuna. Your faith is all about, all around. So, Socher means all about, and it's as correlated in this Pasuk to the word Emunah, to the concept of Emunah. So, again, um, it's called Eretz Canaan as a reference that Eretz Yisrael is a place of Emunah and a place of Nisim, miracles, and as a result of that, it's on a higher level. And this is what our rabbis say. Eretz Yisrael shows it Eretz Yisrael drinks first. So when all of the blessings of rain come down to the world, Eretz Yisrael is the first one to get a portion. And the rains come from the depths. There's two kinds of depths. There's the lower depth and the upper depth. Kemosh HaKosav, as it says in the Pasuk, Tahom el Tahom kore. Deep to deep, deep calls to deep. There's a connection between the upper depth and the lower depth. But to home, Lashonais, and to home is a language of miracle. So in other words, once we associate the word to home, to miracle, then really what we're saying is to home, el to home, kore. Miracle to miracle, it's, it calls out one miracle to another miracle. But how do we know that the word to home is a language of miracle? Moshe Kosovitz says, and this is from Megillus Rus, which God willing, in a short while, we'll be able to read on, on Purim. So what happened in the story? In the story, Naomi comes home to Eretz Yisrael, where previously she had left during the time of the famine. And she came home, and her life was very different looking at that point than when she had left. She had left at the, at the peak of uh, her life with with a husband and children and everything. And she's coming back in a very different state. And when she comes back to Eretz Yisrael, the Pasuk says, the entire city was bewildered. They were amazed. So the main thing that Rabbi Nachman is pointing out from this is that this bewilderment, this amazement is associated with them coming home to where? To Eretz Yisrael. So Eretz Yisrael is a concept of of um, the Tehom, and they were amazed. They were, they were, it was a wonder, right? So that's associated with Eretz Yisrael. Um, and it also means to home, which means the depths. So we see a correlation between the word to home, meaning the deep, and Tehom, which means to be amazed, like a nace. <coughs> Excuse me, because <coughs> he's going to explain. Ki al nes because on a miracle I know al devar chidush. That's with regard to something that's brand new. Nasmin, when when we have something that's brand new, totally unexpected, catches us off base, right? Catches us totally by surprise. We're bewildered. We're amazed by it. And something brand new like that. So we see that the word tzmein, um is to be amazed, and it also means to home, as I said before. And this is what our rabbi said. The sound, the voice of the dove is heard in our land. That's a reference to rains. That's a reference to rains. Because the main um, rains are heard in Eretz Yisrael. Kisham HaTahomos, because that's where the deeps, the depths are that we referred to before. Haino Hanisim, which we said that Tahom is, um, the, toh, the Tehom is to be amazed, to be surprised, right, by something new, something that you, you that doesn't fall within the realm of, uh, you know, nature, so to speak. Haino Emuna. And that's emuna, tefillah, slash tefillah. 
So this is a concept that Rabbi Nachman refers to a lot of times. In order to have balance in the world, we have opposing forces. Um, as we said, no spiritual gain can be made in any area without some resistance from the other side. And to the extent that one moves himself towards the side of Kedusha, to that extent, there's going to be an equal and opposite force on the other side, leading in order so that a person maintain the equilibrium of uh, Bechira, of free choice. Because if you were in a state of seeing Hashem healed in such clarity that there was no doubt, then we would be in the state, in the state of existence of Shia, and there would be practically no Bechira at that point, or there would be no Bechira at that point, no free choice. It would be wonderful but it wouldn't be a state of free choice. This world is, is all about free choice. So, so on the one hand, we have miracle and, and amuna and Eretz Yisrael. What's on the flip side of that? What's on the exact polar opposite of that? In Mitzrayim, for Hefech Eretz Yisrael. It's Mitzrayim. Remember I said that, that Rabbi Nachman uses the story in, in Tanakh as not just events that happen, but rather as paradigms for for understanding all future um, uh, situations. So here he's saying, Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim, the state of Mitzrayim and the place of Mitzrayim is the polar opposite of Eretz Yisrael. Zel umazat, one opposite the other. Mashkosov, as he says, in Mitzrayim, Nasim the Koso, that Egypt, the Egyptians, ran towards him. So in other words, the Bnei Yisrael were going, traveling through the Amsuf, and foolishly, the, uh, the Egyptians were chasing after us into the sea, as if they were running into the water. And Egypt, Mitzrayim, which Meitzah, by the way, is not just the name of a place. The word Meitzah means a constriction, a, 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 a stressed place of, of minimization of creativity and life and, and freshness and all things good. So that's what Neitzah means, a, 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 a confined space. Umas Hanisim. So this is in place, this is in instead of the miracles of Eretz Yisrael. Up, in other words, the, 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 the polar opposite of Eretz Yisrael is Mitzrayim. And Zen, because of this, aim welcome to feel of Mitzrayim. There's no way you can dive in a Mitzrayim. Kemosh Kosov, as it says in the Pesach, Vahayo Ketesi Esair, Ephros Kapai. Moshe Rabbeinu told Paro during one of the Makos, you know, you want me to stop the Makos? Sure, no problem. I could go and dive in Hashem, but I can't do it in Mitzrayim. I can't do it over here because this place is, is so far gone. There's nothing I can do here. I need to leave this place then I can spread out my arms and I can beg with Hashem that he stop this, this part of the plague or this, this maka, this plague. But you see that he couldn't do it when he was in Mitzrayim. He feels that because of this, when Avraham was pogame with regard to Eretz Yisrael, pogame means pogam, a blemish. Now you'll say, well, Avraham, how could you say such a thing? Avraham was... They had a blemish with regard to Eretz Yisrael. Avram was our, the first of the Avos, the first of our forefathers. He was amazing. Well, yeah, that's absolutely true, except in one very, very slight area. And Rebbe Nachman is going to explain that at the moment, at the time when HaKadosh Baruch Hu was promising him Ali Rushas Aretz, that he was going to inherit the land, right? In the dream, when he went uh, uh, by the uh, Brisbane of Sorim, he says, you're going to inherit the land. And what was Avraham's reaction? Oma, he said, Ma Ada, how will I know? How will I know? So somebody with, somebody with absolutely flawless, I'm gonna even beyond the level where Avraham was at that moment, doesn't ask the Ma'eda. Hashem said something, you know what's going to happen. You have a complete, absolute Amunah. Now, Avram had a 
a billion gazillion levels of emuna. But a little bit, there was something, a little something missing from even Avraham's level of emuna where it should have been. I hope I'm saying this properly, not to upset anybody, but I'm trying to incorporate the thought into the Rebbe's words. And he is saying that Avraham himself, when he said the words, how will I know that what you're telling me will come to fruition? It was a blemish in, in a perfect level of faith, of Amuna. So, so then he was informed by Hashem, oh, that your children are going to go down to Mitzrayim. Because he had a pagam in Amuna. He had a blemish, a slight blemish in his Amuna. I know Eretz Yisrael, and we said Eretz Yisrael is Amuna. Eretz Yisrael is Nisim, miracles. Eretz Yisrael is Tila. Eretz Yisrael is Amuna. Bechinas Nisim. The Yorad, Yaakov, and Mitzrayim, and Yaakov and his sons went down to Mitzrayim. So now you know, if you didn't know before, why the Jews had to go down to, to Mitzrayim and spend time there and almost fall apart there entirely. Unfortunately, why do they have to do a, a, a do time, so to speak, in Mitzrayim? Because they needed to cleanse, to fix, to repair this pagam in Avram Avinu when he said Bama Eda. So actually, they were they were helping Avraham along his mission. They were they were doing their part to elevate the status of the Bnei Yisrael, where even Avraham himself couldn't go at the moment. So so Mitzrayim is the exact opposite of miracles. Because Rabbi Nachman said that, that we always have to have Kedusha and Tuma, purity and, and impurity, equal portions. And as a result of that, because there's an Eretz Yisrael that's so holy and so pure, there's an Eretz Mitzrayim as well. We are to Davka Yaakov of Ovanov. So now, why did Yaakov go down? Why not Avraham? Why not Yitzchak? Why Yaakov? So he says, Ki hu pagam be Eretz Yisrael. The pagam, since the blemish was with regard to Eretz Yisrael, Bechinas Tfila, which is synonymous with the idea of Tfila. The Yadu Yaakov of Anav, and therefore Yaakov and his sons had to go down to Mitzrayim. Shame Bechinas Tfila, because Yaakov represented Tfila. Yaakov was the embodiment of perfection of Tfila. In other words, once Avraham said, Bama Eda, there was a problem, quote unquote. There was a problem that needed to be fixed. It could be fixed, and it was fixed, but it needed to be fixed. Who is the one who was going to be able to do that fixing? Only Yaakov could have done it. Only Yaakov, because Yaakov embodied tefillah, prayer. Shehem bechina shnei shari tefillah, because he embodied the 12 gates of prayer. They were all wrapped up in him and his sons. Yal yidei she'ikar ha-tefillah, heim Yaakov, ovanov, and because the main tefillah is Yaakov and his sons, al yidei zeh lo yizacha le'eretz Yisrael, al yidei zeh lo yizacha le'eretz Yisrael, bechina tefillah, el Yaakov ovanov. The only ones who were Zoha to Eretz Yisrael were none other than Yaakov, because they were tefillah. So in other words, Yaakov went down to Mitzrayim, his 12 sons went down to Mitzrayim, and their progeny went up to Eretz Yisrael and inherited the land. Full, when it finally came full circle, that's who went into Eretz Yisrael, the offspring of Yaakov Avinu. Of Yaakov enough, only Yaakov and his sons could have accomplished such a feat. Moshe says, "Ki be Yitzchak, Yikari lecha lach zera." Excuse me, "Ki be Yit, Ki be Yitzchak, Yikari lecha zera." I'll try one more time. "Ki be Yitzchak, Yikari lecha zara," because in Yitzchak it will be called a, to you a seed. Meaning, what does that mean? Why are we talking about Yitzchak if we we're talking about Yaakov? Because it says "Ki be Yitzchak," because in Yitzchak says Rabbi Nachman. Yitzchak, but not the whole Yitzchak. Part of Yitzchak is going to go down and, and, and be able to be masakin, to repair this Pagan. Part of Yitzchak. What part of Yitzchak? Not Esav, that's for sure. Uh-uh, Yaakov. 
Yaakov and his sons are going to be the ones. This is what our rabbis say when they say that the that the um, that the rains do not fall except we're almost done for tonight and we're almost done with the full lesson. Again, this is a quick intended to be a quick overview of this Torah and not necessarily an in-depth one. I recommend either going over it yourself or listening to the shiurim again um, just to keep the ideas fresh in your mind or just do your best to try to remember and uh, my best to try to uh, reference. So Bishvila Amona, because rain comes because of Amuna, because of faith. I don't like to translate Amuna as faith, but we'll, we'll go with that for right now. Haina Bechinas Eretz Yisrael, and that we said, Amuna, Eretz Yisrael, Nisi, miracles, Tfila, all of these ideas are synonymous. Shuhu Bechinas Tfila, Bechinas Amuna. Oh, so I said what Rabbi Nachman was about to say. But he shows a tequila, and Eretz Yisrael drinks first. Shisham hatahomos bechinas nisim, because that's where the deeps, the depths are. The tahomos, right? We we said the tehom that they were surprised. Blush on tahomos that nisim are things that you're surprised about. That's where it happens. That's why when when they weren't surprised when when uh, when Naomi left, they might have been, but. The, Megillah doesn't say that, but they were surprised when she came back to Eretz Yisrael. Kamosh Kosov, as it says, Viteyam Kalayir, the whole city was bewildered. They were amazed. Because it was something unexpected. And this is what our rabbis say. <coughs> Excuse me. At, a, at the moment when the rains fall, even the pruta, pruta is the smallest denomination of coin. So even that kind of a coin, sees, you know, it's like the old expression, when the tide goes up, all the boats in the harbor go up. So when the rains fall, even the pruta, even a simple coin, the, the lowest denomination, gets a bracha. So what does that mean? So the Gemara gives a couple of explanations. One explanation is that a pruta is a coin, and a coin doesn't require rain. But the, the Gemara is trying to tell us that even things that don't benefit directly from rain, but when it rains, everything benefits, even those things that don't derive benefit uh, directly from, from the rain itself. That's one explanation. Another explanation is that, no, actually the pruta, the coin, does get a benefit when it rains. Why? Because when it rains and there's an abundance of crops, now that pruta has more buying power. It can go out there and buy a lot more than it did if it wouldn't be raining and things were very expensive. But the bottom line is that we're going to explore here is that a pruta should be kiss. The word be kiss is very important because it means a pocket, pruta in the pocket. So imagine you have a coin in your pocket. It's hidden. It's hidden from sight. Pruta zebechinas kohator the pruta is the concept of the, the sound, the voice of the dove. And our rabbis have said, Hi, Rudya, Damulator. This Rudya, now Rudya is the name of the Malach, the angel that's in charge of rain. And the Malach positions himself between the upper level rain and the lower level rain. And he controls. The flow from one to the other. So this high Rudya, this Rudya, this Malach called Rudya, who controls the, the rain, Damulator is comparable to an ox. Now in Hebrew, Tor means dove. In Aramaic, Tor means ox. Sometimes a, a tuff in Aramaic is in place of a shin. So if you replace the, the tuff here with a shin, it becomes shor, ox. But anyway, in Aramaic, Tor is ox. So this malach it looks like an ox. Uprita shivavase, and its lips are split open. It's got an open mouth. But you'll notice the word prita 
is a lot like the word pruta. And that's what Rabbi Nachman is pointing out here. And it, it, it exists between one level of the depth and the other level of the depth, it's between the two. Which incorporates this Malach is in charge of all of the these waters, these water sources, which are the embodiment of miracles. So in other words, when we, when we experience rainfall and then things start to grow as a result of that and the world benefits, that's, an, that's a notion, that's a concept of miracle. And this is what's meant by, oh, wait a second. You'll say, wait, that's not miracle. That's, na that's nature. Uh, the water evaporates, it goes up into the sky, it forms a cloud, comes down. Hold on a second, not so fast. Listen to what he says. Vizet pruta shukis. And this is the pruta in the pocket, the pruta, the coin, that lo lowest denomination coin, which is in the pocket. There are times when the power of miracles are obscured, they're hidden, they're covered up. But through the rains, the pruta is blessed. Meaning, I know Meaning that miracles, the miracles split open the mouth. And these are like the people who deny miracles. And they say, everything is working according to the laws of nature. That's why I said, hold on a second. You said rain, rain is a natural phenomenon. Yes, it can be explained naturally. But the fact that rain works the way it does doesn't have to be that way. That is just as much a miracle as if Hashem would cause the mud to fall in the midbar from the sky, as opposed to having it grow from the ground or have water come out of a, a flint rock. These were Nisim as well. But, but that doesn't mean that the things that we're accustomed to seeing as nature aren't Nis as well also. But there are some people who want to be, who want to say, and maybe there's even a little part of each one of us that says, no, that's not a miracle. That's, I expect that to happen. We have to train ourselves though to say, no, no, no. It doesn't have to happen that way. It's happening that way because the Kodesh Baruch Hu is making it happen that way each and every time. And that, these acts of nature, so to quote unquote, unquote, are as miraculous as anything else that would happen that would be outside the natural order of things. The Imro and Eza Nes, and if we would see such a miracle, hey, if, in other words, if they would see such a miracle, these, these miracle deniers, hey, Nes in they cover it up and say that it's just the laws of nature. This is just the way of the nature of the natural world. You know, and I've said this for, for a long time. Just because we have scientific capability that can explain the predictability of the laws of nature and other things, and we can, we can predict and we can modify and we can harness wonderful, all of those things. But that doesn't change the fundamental reality that Hashem created it that way. And Hashem wills it into existence each and every time. Just the, the fact that something happened a hundred times in a row without fail doesn't mean that it's going to happen the next hundred times like that. Even science says that. Science comes to a higher level of predictability. They don't, they don't ever say that something is a hundred percent because until it's been tried and tested, it's not, it's not quote unquote believed. Um, as, as a law, so to speak. So we have laws, we have rules of nature that we have observed, but those laws of nature are nice. They're miracle. So it, it turns out that they, these people who deny the concept of miracles and ascribe it all to the natural world, they cause a blemish in tefillah, because tefillah, as we said before, is nice. Why? Shoshana Sateba, because it changes nature. When we daven, we're saying, Hashem, my reality is telling me that I have X, Y, Z as, as my reality. And I'm davening to you that I should have a different reality, maybe a, a better reality than what I have right now, a healthier reality than what I have right now. 
And then when it happens, God willing, that's a news. That's a miracle. Because the reality was, the physical reality was that it should be the way it was. And once you dive in and can change that reality, well, that change, that tila causes a miracle to happen. So tila itself is nice. But when we deny this part of the process, we blemish emuna. And then we, it's as if we say that we don't believe in the, in the interaction of Hashem Yisbarach in the world. The hashkach of Hashem, meaning Hashem is an involvement. And we cause a blemish in Eretz Yisrael, which is a place of miracles. <coughs> the sound of the dove was heard in our land. As they say, Eretz Yisrael shows a tchila. Eretz Yisrael drinks first. This is, he's inc- including everything that we've said so far. Eretz Yisrael is the place of wonders and miracles. The whole city was amazed. And if there's a pagam in this emuna of Hashem, the only way to fix it is to do a stint and the gullus <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is to do a stint in gullus mitzrayim. So, kizet lo mazet also, because once there's a pagam that forces us out of a state of emuna, that blemish forces us out of living in a state of emuna and nace and tefillah, well, where are we supposed to go then? There's no other choice. As soon as we leave that state of Amuna and Nais and Tila, we're thrust into Mitzrayim. And all Galios are nicknamed in the name of Mitzrayim. So Rabbi Nachman says on a national level and on an individual level, we all go through exiles of sorts for different reasons and different ways. And they're all harkened back to this concept of Mitzrayim of being constricted because when a person lacks the, the tools, the spiritual tools that he needs, he, he then gets removed from the situation where he was, meaning Eretz Yisrael, and he gets put, unfortunately, into a perhaps a little bit of a more constricted place called Mitzrayim. Hashem Shehem Mitzrayim the Yisrael because the Mitzrayim, the Egyptians, caused pain, trouble for the Bnei Yisrael. Okay, last, last little paragraph for tonight. And we're all done with the Torah. Uh, and I hope that you found it as beautiful and meaningful as I did so far. The Zepay Rish, and this is the explanation of to Homos uh, Originally, we started the Torah with a Pasuk of the depths cover them. They will be covered by the depths. They go down into the depths like a stone. Right? That was the Pasuk we started. And now Ibn Ahmed is going full circle with the original Pasuk. And he says, the depths will cover them. So what does that really mean, says Ibn Ahmed? It means, it means, Someone who covers over miracles. And he is determined to say and believe that everything that happens is within the natural order, that there's no nace, but rather it's it's teva, it's natural, it's nature. There's no, God forbid, that there's no Hashem involvement. Yardubim solas kamal el oven. They will go down. Those people will go down like a stone into the depths. Misham Roa Evan Yisrael. From there, they will graze the the stone of, of Yisrael. Meaning they will harvest up. Meaning Targumo of Uran, the father and the son. So the word Aven is a contraction of two words, Av and Ben. Evan Av Nun. Av, 
on the one side, and Ben on the other side, Aleph Beis, and then Beis Nun. So what does this mean? In Mitzolos, Zebuchinus Mitzrayim. In Mitzolos, the depths, that's the, um, the reference to Mitzrayim. How is Mitzolos a reference to Mitzrayim, the word Mitzolos? Because it says, Vainatzlo es Mitzrayim. So in other words, after the final Maka, when the day Israel left Mitzrayim, the Pesach tells us that they cleaned them out of all of the wealth. So Vinatslu means they cleaned them out. So you see that the word Vinatslu in this Pesach is correlated to, the, to Mitzrayim, to the word Mitzrayim. So when we say Mitzolos, we're talking about Mitzrayim, Kamo, Hav, Uvanon like the father and the son. I know Yaakov of Anav, meaning that's Yaakov and his sons, Shem Bechinas Tila, who are the epitome of prayer. Bechinas Nisim, and prayer is Nisim, miracle. Bechinas Eretz Yisrael, and Yaakov and Tfila and Nais is all of it's correlated to Eretz Yisrael. Tfili Ridasam, or Lafi HaPagam, Shopagam B'Tfila, because of their Yurida, because of their going down to Mitzrayim, because of lack of emuna and tefila, a pagam, a blemish in their level of tefila and emuna, of Eretz Yisrael and in er, of Eretz Yisrael, Cain, Sorech, Leve, like Hagolos, so did they need to go down to the depths of the exile, to the Golos, Shom Mitzrayim, of even Moshe Yod, Yaakov, of Anav, just like Yaakov and his sons went down Mitzrayim, to Mitzrayim, to Shom Avram, Due to the fact when Abraham said, Bama Ada, how will I know? And he was referring to the inheritance of the land. And this is the, the end of Rabbi Nachman's words. So the Pasuk of Tahomo Sihasimu is translated like, translated like this Tahomo Sihasimu, those who try to cover up the fact that there's nace in the world and try to ascribe everything only to the physical, to the derech atel, to the laws of nature, yardu bim tzolos, that person, those people have to go down to Mitzrayim, yardu bim tzolos, they have to go down to Mitzrayim, kamo el oven, just like the original one who had to go down to repair this, which was Yaakov and its 12 sons. So, um, it was a slight pagan in Avraham Avinu, but then it was repaired by the, the tremendous greatness in Tefillah and Amunah of Yaakov and his sons. All right, so therein concludes the second part of First, we were going to do a quick review, which we did, and we finished the Torah, which we did. So if anybody still wants to hang out and ask any questions, um, we, we can end it for right now. <coughs> excuse me and like i said thank you for sticking with me i know it was a quick go through the torah but you'll see what i mean when we start next week God willing you'll all come um and uh you'll see what i mean when when the, when you have amazing clarity with what red nussin is going to teach us in the in the coming weeks i think you'll appreciate having this torah you know in your in mind and not just synopsized by yours truly but hearing Rabbi Nachman's own words, Lashon Rabbeinu. So uh, thank you very much for, for joining me. And, um, and welcome back to Tanya. And I don't remember if Farrell was here last week, maybe. And uh, Pamela, thank you for being uh, not shy and, and coming back if it was uh, a bit overwhelming last week. I hope tonight was a little bit slower, a little bit, a little bit more less frenetic, a little clearer. Um, and this is pretty much probably going to be the pace we're going to continue with the Lakute Halachos. But um, if anybody has any questions or comments or thoughts that they had during the week about our lesson or that they'd either like to ask or share, feel free. And if not, that's fine because uh, sometimes these words, um, they, they have a way of dwelling on our minds. And then when we're in the real life situation, um, we think of them and they have tremendous meaning to us. So I'll just wait a second and see if there's anything I want to add. But uh, it was a tremendous pleasure for me to to do this part so far till till here.
and I immensely look forward to continuing and learning the halakhas with you. Okay. If anybody also, um, <coughs> excuse me, I believe my, <coughs> I believe my email is on the website also. So if anybody has any questions or comments or ideas they want to share or even applications, uh, feel free to shoot me out an email. And, uh, and that's it. So thank you very much for joining me. And have a wonderful Shabbos. Thank you.